Hello, I am Gunnar Danger, the Vice President of the Professional Arts Society, and today we are here with Jamie and Giuliano Villani. Mm -hmm. You said it right. <laughs> the only person ever says it right, yeah. So to start off, um, I wanted to first ask about uh, your background, going through art school and then maybe MFA program and then post-art school, getting into a gallery. All right, so I went to Rutgers uh, for undergrad for art and um, it's not really like an art school, it's more of like a giant public school. So like a lot of my friends that, uh, you know, were artists and stuff, or that are artists all kind of went to like, you know, Yale or Columbia or whatever the fuck, you know. Um, so like my background was kind of like really normal. So I was surrounded by like, you know, a bunch of bio kids and shit like that, you know, like sports medicine. So I kind of kept me like, it wasn't like insular, like art bag, circle truck, you know. So just around like normal fucking students all day too. Mm -hmm. I went there and then um, I basically just like did painting and shit. I didn't get um, a master's. I don't think you need to. You know, I think it's, I mean, for, I don't really think you need to go to school for art, really. Unfortunately, you know, like, I don't know, like a lot of my, like my painting, I'm pretty self-taught, you know, so like, you know, just kind of practicing and then uh, to get a job, there's this website called Nightbra, I lied and said I could paint, like paint really well, because I actually was not a very good painter and I lied and I just kind of learned on the job. And then from there, like, you know, I didn't go to grad school, but I learned more for working for other artists than I think you would in school. Um, but so then I just like hustled my ass off and I just started working for a bunch of different artists, like this guy, Eric Parker, which was a Paul Kasman, and then Dana Schutz I worked for for a couple of years. And I worked for this other guy, Jules Boundcourt, and like a bunch of, you know, and then I worked at a gallery as like the gallery bitch, Leo <laughs> Cornick, which closed. But like, um, you know, it was just like, juggling a bunch of jobs, but I learned so much working for those people, you know? And then, um, yeah, I just started like making paintings in my bedroom, you know? And it was funny because when I was making paintings, I was, this is like before Instagram was a thing and shit, you know? And it just started, but whatever, you know? And I didn't think anyone was ever gonna see them. So I was just kind of making whatever the fuck I wanted, you know, regardless if it was like embarrassing or not. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people started seeing them. I, had, I got lucky, I got a show, like pure luck and timing at this small shitty gallery in Brooklyn called Boston Projects, which is closed too. And then shit just snowballed from there. Just crazy. Now, were you painting while you were at Rutgers too? Or did it start once yeah. you were the artist assistant? And you know, let me see if I could find a photo of what my old fucking studio looked like. It was insane. Like it was a shithole. I was painting when I was in school. I actually did here, I'll show you. Okay, I was painting, but I wasn't very good. And I was doing like minimalist shit, which is like, what the fuck? You know, because I just liked how democratic it was. And then I realized, like, wow, whatever I'm doing is not doing what I thought it would be, you know, because I was like looking at like Judd and like Al Held and stuff like in like, um, you know, here we go. Yes. <laughs> like the fuck, right. So I was so that was at Rutgers. Like, yeah, this was, uh, I was 20 years old. So I was like obsessed with Dan Graham. So I was like looking at that kind of shit. And then Years later, here's my other studio in college. Here we go. Okay. So then, you know, that was what it looked like. I was into Mike Kelly and stuff like that, and Robert Smithson. Mike Smithson went to Rutgers. So then, here's me working at Dana's studio, like, I don't know, eight years ago. And here's me working for Eric Parker with Mike Dotson. Who is, I worked for Eric for a long time, too. And we basically made all the paintings. And then this is my first studio. It's my bedroom. You know? Crazy, right? Yeah. Here's something from, uh, I don't even know how, this is 2009. I think. So that's 2009. Here's another one. Weird, right? Who the fuck knew? And now I'm making who knows what, you know? But I was kind of experimenting. And the thing is like, you know, I went to school for sculpture and painting, but um, my parents are like commercial printers. So I kept on seeing, you know, we grew up in this factory in Newark and they made like silk screen, the silk screen factory. So I kept on seeing all these like logos being like printed over and over again. So like Yankees and like, you know, the pizza place, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's like seeing all those things just being printed through. It's kind of when I got interested in like appropriation. I think it was just around me my whole life. So 
it's kind of, you know, and I also like how democratic it is. So that's kind of where the shit started, you know, if that makes sense. Going off that idea of appropriation, in, in a lot of your paintings, you, you take these images from different sources. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that's a, an effect of like internet culture and the accessibility of images and that kind of stuff? Or is that just your interests just manifesting on the canvas? Basically, I'm like a translator or a DJ, you know? That's how I like to think of it. And also, like I say this in every interview, but like say you're just making paintings based off your own stuff, right? How boring is a lecture versus a chorus, you know? A chorus has multitudes of voices and levels, you know? So that's why I think it's like, and I also think that um, if something's good enough to have one life, it should have a second or a third or a fourth, you know? And I'm just like the editor that goes through and finds those things and uh, creates like, some kind of arranged marriage, you know? Because I just want to paint things that I haven't seen put together before, but not just for juxtaposition purposes, but for conceptual purposes, you know? So it's kind of like, it's not like random at all, you know? It's like very, very specific. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's a line when appropriation is actually like good or when it's just like a blatant copy. And I'm down with either or, you know? <laughs> I don't give a shit. So, you know, and if anyone, like, it's funny, like, people hit me up all the time, like, you know, this is blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, duh. I'm like, I told you this, like, everyone knew this shit from day one. It's not something I hide. It's, like, very essential to my work, actually, you know? So, but, um, yeah, because I, you know, I like looking at things all the time, you know? Like, who makes a painting and doesn't think about a painting before, you know? Yeah. You're making an abstract painting, you're going to be thinking about, you know, the cooning or something. You're going to think of your image of what an uh, abstract painting is. You know, yeah. so why not just like go full throttle to get the goddamn, grab the goddamn thing that already worked once. And then, you know, you know. I've heard that you have like this book just full of, well, maybe not like a physical book, but maybe like mm -hmm. notes and stuff just full of ideas. I'll show you, here, I'll grab one. So, I don't know if you've ever read the Andy Warhol Diaries, but it was in my bathroom in high school. It's like a huge book. And he's wrote down everything obsessively. It's like a great bathroom book, right? Mm -hmm. And he had, he would have these little boxes where, you know, basically he'd leave them open, they'd be vessels. And he would just drop the shit in throughout the day and save them. So like I do that for each thing, you know. It's just, like just some stuff from like 2018. So like, you know, like notes, this kind of shit. Like you know. Uh, Jesus, like half these don't even make sense. They're like drunk scribbles, but you know these are all notes that I keep um, because you never know. You know, like I don't even know what the hell. Do you go back bag, through these you know? old boxes? What? Do you go back through these old boxes? If I'm really desperate, I do. I think that these things have a shelf life, you know. But um, you know, like I'll keep everything. I I try to not because I think it's important. Or like anyone will care, but just because I like, I, I'm a hoarder of stuff. Like, you know, this is how we like start painting, coming up with colors and shit. Um, there's tons of stuff. This is just from 2018. You know, this is, I have 2019, 2020. And then, you know, I, once I find out like something's, I think it's important. You never know. I come up with so many fucking ideas, you know, that's my problem. I have too many ideas and I need to edit them. So, but like, you know, once in a while, like some drunk thing from 10 years ago could be really good when I'm like senile or I'm like half dead, you know? What percentage of these ideas actually make it onto the canvas? Like two. <laughs> but it's funny, it's like I spend so much energy coming up with the ideas. Like that's the fun part. Like fuck the romanticized painting part, you know? Yeah. The only reason why I paint is because it's a way to get there, you know, to like express that idea. Like if I could do it, I mean, I would do performance every day if I could, but that doesn't pay the bills and no one cares. And no one wants to sit through a performance, you know? So for you, the work is that idea that you come up with? Mm -hmm. And then the thing is, if I can visualize it on, on a canvas, that means it'll work. Mm -hmm. If I can't visualize it and it's just like an abstract thought, then fuck it, it could, be, it could sound great, but I won't look that good. You know what I mean? Because it's gotta look good at the, or look like something at the same time, you know? Yeah. But. I want to start, I wanted to try to do some abstract paintings, but it just is like so hard for me. Like my brain can't go there, you know? Like I just need to, I don't know. I need to be blindfolded or something or take some edibles because it's like, I just don't understand how that works. You know, like, especially in context of now, like, I don't know what the fuck it's trying to communicate. 
besides looking like art, you know? Right. But if I can make it seem real or feel good doing it, then who knows? But I tried it once. It was not, it did not come out too well. <laughs> And I thought if you had like all the right colors, you can't really fuck it up. Oh, you can. You can totally fuck it up, you know? Yeah. So that's like, you know, how do you make something look aloof and thought out at the same time? Yeah. You can't really. So who knows? I feel like so much of what draws me personally to your paintings are those recognizable moments where I'm like, oh, I've seen that. And then it don't takes know where. a whole new context. Yeah. Well, the thing is that the paintings are kind of all about, for me, when I make something, you know, like all the references, they look somewhat familiar, but you can't quite place them, you know? So it's kind of like the dollar store generic brand of something else, you know? Or it's kind of like slightly removed. So then it becomes kind of like a memory or something where you can't quite place it. So that's what I'm interested in. And like, you know, the paintings kind of all started out, came from, I have PTSD. They started from my PTSD into uh, like some form of trauma and then into some form of memory and then into just, pure like um like uh i don't even know how i describe it now like i i kind of want to get less of the frenetic shit all the junk out of it you know like i don't want them to be like visual overloads or anything you know it's like that's not what i'm trying to make here you know mm -hmm. but does that make any sense or no i think so <laughs> mm -hmm. but like yeah they're supposed to function like a memory or something where it kind of haunts you in a way or you know yeah so you know, as, you're, as you're planning for like shows and you're building up like a series, do you start thinking about the works connected together or is totally. it very much like one isolated piece? Well, that's the thing. Every show, every painting I do, they're all totally different. I don't do series of anything because I think that's such a bullshit thing. You know, like, no, like honestly, the hardest thing is coming up with something new every fucking time, you know, mm -hmm. and having it be good or at least serve a purpose, a new purpose, you know. So this next show I'm doing with Jasmine at JPT, which is I think gonna be in October, who the fuck knows with this COVID shit, but right. um, I think it's going to be like salon style with like 35 paintings, you know? And I mean, that's good enough for me to have a theme. They're all it's salon style, you know? Because if I had a theme, I'd be so bored in two seconds, you know? Now are these all large scale? Cause your paintings are pretty large. So far the ones I have now are pretty big, but the thing is, Painting small is actually way more difficult once you go up like big boy size. Cause like, oh look how big these ones are behind me. Oh, wait, let me see if I can, shit. Yep. <laughs> There's him. These are big, like look for scale, you can see. Huge. You know, but like once you do that, then you do it on small, it feels like you're painting on fingernails, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just gotta get used to it again. So it's a different kind of thing, but I do like the, it's like kind of like, you know, there's a bravado of painting large, but that's not why, you know, a lot of people paint big because it looks important or whatever. But for me, I'm just short and it's easier for me, you know? So, and like, you know, not taking stuff off is not fun when it's like this big. So, but I want to kind of get into the smaller works because it feels a little bit more earnest. And if it could do the same job and still be good, like this big, why the fuck not, you know? Speaking of, uh, you mentioned JTT Gallery. I just saw Sam McInnes' show where he had all those little pieces just like arranged in that grid. He literally just texted me. No way. <laughs> he said, I'm ready to become a main influencer. I don't know what the fuck that means, but yeah, no, Sam's great. His studio's like two blocks away. No way. Yeah. So, I mean, because we're all, it's like, it's cool. Like, this is the thing with galleries, I think, in my personal opinion. I'm like, okay, I have two galleries. I have one that's like the big shot money OG shit. And then I have like the low key smart one in New York, which is like, I think a really good move. First of all, like when you get a gallery, my advice is, hey, here, I'm gonna give you guys like, this is the advice to tell everyone. But if you want to actually have a career in art, I will tell you some tips that will, you can cut out all the bullshit, like art save you five years of bullshit, like stuff you don't wanna do. So basically what I did was like, A, like go, any gallery you like, or anyone you know you're interested in, go to all the openings, show up, you know, and then they'll start recognizing you because you go to every fucking thing, like who the fuck is that guy, right? On your phone, create a folder of all your bangers, you know, like all your good work. Cause like, if you meet someone and they want like, oh, I'm an artist, like, let me see. No one's gonna wait for you to fucking scroll through your phone. You know, you just can hand them the phone. You don't have to be scared of any nudes or anything. They can take their time, they'll look through it. And you know, basically have that shit on hand. So say you're at an opening, Maybe you meet the director or an art handler or something. You show them their shit, your shit. 
maybe they don't like you. Maybe they have like a friend who's a shittier gallery somewhere and they'll be like, oh, pass your name along. You know, that's one thing. Another thing is like, if you have studio visits, try to stack. Like, I had a fucking calendar up and I put like studio, fake studio visits on the calendar in Sharpie, like big, like blah, blah, blah is coming, you know? So I, I have like a collector over and they're like, oh damn, like the hammer's coming over. I'm like, yeah, you know? So the shit like that, or like if you have people coming over, try to have them all on the same day so they bump into each other and they make it until you make it. <laughs> totally, until you make it. Um, that works. I also think if, say, you have a collector over or someone who's interested in your work and they want to know what's available, just lie and say most of it's on hold. And only show them like the one or two that aren't. So they think that there's like a thing for it, you know? And also, when you do an art fair or you do an art booth or anything, less is more. Don't give them everything. Give them one piece. Because if you give them three, how hard do you think they're going to work to sell that? Not that hard. If you give them one, they're going to push. You know? And so they do sell it, right? Maybe some, that person wants to come over to your studio, right? You have two on the back burner. You know what I mean? You shit to show them. You know? Those are sorry. I have more, but I'll remember in a bit. Whatever. But those are, those are some good ones, you know, that actually do fucking work. But, and all, yeah, and, like, uh, just form, like, friends, like, groups of friends, you know, that are artists. And, like, hook and each other up. Who was your friend group with the artists? Now I'm a big friend group, but it's, like, it started out with, like, me, you know, everyone, like, Borna Samick, who shows at JTT, Ajay Karian, who shows at 47 Canal, Brian Villada shows at Gavin Brown, um, Josh Avalo, uh, like, you know, a shitload of people, you know. But we all kind of, like, hooked each other up, like, you know, Calvin Marcus, we all kind of like helped each other out, like when we were coming up and shit, you know. Did and you now, just seeing mm -hmm. at shows and stuff like that. Yeah, like my we, there was a really cool thing in New York. It was called No More Games, and it was run by three of my friends, and it was awesome. It was like they don't have shit like this anymore. It's all artist run, but they would do weird shows with weird people. It's all like friends and shit. But then they'd have like Dan Graham or Mike Kelly in it, you know. But it was like low key. It wasn't, it was like instant, it was across from fucking Dunkin' Donuts and it was open for like seven years. And it was like always a fucking rager whenever they had opening, you know? So, but like now it's like, I think, no offense, but I think all you young people, I mean, I'm not that old, but I feel like in New York, it's very much about um, style and like, oh, I'm an artist and it's like this Lower East Side trash scene where it's, like, I don't expect any gallery to last more than like fucking three months because no one's making work that they take seriously. It just looks like, like it should be a tattoo or something. You know what I mean? So that's that's my that's old pitch coming in right now. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, there are some young artists that are good. I think it just, it's funny because like, um, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's weird. I feel like Instagram and shit kind of ruined it mm -hmm. in a way, you know, or ruined you, like the way young people's perception of what art is because it's become like so aestheticized by like, you know, like nails and like, it's like this like Tumblr thing that's like 10 years too late, yeah. you know? Yeah. Or like this rehash of 90s culture from people who were born past the 90s. It just doesn't, it's like this false nostalgia, which I think is kind of ruining the way people look at images, you know, which makes, I don't know if that sounds weird or not, but whatever. Do you, think that, do you think that that just muddies everything? It, does anything rise to the top as like the cream of the crop? Or does it just... Hopefully, I think that there's going to be a resurgence of internet art, weirdly. You know, because in the early 2000s, there was this huge internet art scene with, like, Corey Archangel and Borna and, you know, Paper Rad and all the shit. And, uh, like, Force Field, blah, blah, blah. So that was cool then, but now the internet's so different now, but I think everyone's at home. And no one wants to look at fucking painting and sculptures online, honestly. I don't, you know? So the only thing that makes sense to look at that's art-wise online is something that's meant to be seen through a computer, you know? So I feel like someone's going to figure out a way to rehash the shit, hopefully. Cause that'd be cool, you know. But like, what else are we gonna look at? I don't want to look at a fucking, you know what I mean? Like paintings don't look good on the computer unless they're, you know. You're not into the whole online viewing rooms, VR no. experience. No. No. My uh, my gallery in um, London, like they have a gallery in London and they have one in Milan. And I was talking to the director, like you know, she's drunk, I'm drunk for FaceTiming. She's like trapped there too. She's like, yeah, we're doing a 3D model of the gallery and stuff, and I'm like, fuck that. No one cares. You know what you should do? You should just take an artist, like take Urs Fisher, right? Have him do whatever he wants with whatever shit it could be. Like he could be fucking cooking drunk at three in the morning. He could do, change the website to be whatever he wants. He could do live streams. He could do whatever he wants. 
basically he has the platform to do anything he wants with the Mossman effect for like a week. Then next, who else? Maurizio Catalan could go next. He could do whatever he wants. It's cool because it's live and people will actually tune in. Yeah. It's yeah. actually interesting. And the people that are buying art are still going to buy art. You know, but like you want to look relevant and be engaged. You know, people do shit that is like in real time. It's actually interesting. Do that because it's not like they're spending any money right now. They're spending money on rent. So while you're, everyone's at home just waiting for Corona to blow over, you can like, you know, promote your yeah. roster of artists. Yeah, you could just make like sculptures right now. Like I could, you know, I go on chat roulette all the time. And like, instead of talking to people, we make like drunk sculptures and put it in front of them. And see, you know what I mean? Like stuff like that, you just stack stuff. Like, I don't know. I, I think people are getting really bored and they're getting like more expressive and shit. That, I'd, I'd watch someone make a drunk sculpture. You know, that's way cooler than looking at a fucking 3D model of a gallery that sucks, you know? And that's what I think everyone should be doing, you know? Like live art. Mm -hmm. It's not about selling shit, you know? And then what happens to all that once this blows over, if it blows over? Then we go back to real art. Go back to the real art. (laughs) Yeah, you know? It's cool because everyone's just making stuff right now. It's actually a good time to be an artist, you know? Yeah. But... I mean, other people are fucked, but I think we'll be okay. Also, we're a fluff economy, you know? So, no, it's like, you know, no one's going to die here. You know, it's just art, so. So in terms of, like, your community as an artist, you've talked about your relationship with other artists, your relationship, we should talk about your relationship with your gallerists. Mm -hmm. Who else plays into that picture? Well, it's funny. Like, when I first started showing, um, what I did was I was in a million group shows, right? Like a bunch of group shows. So the thing is, I became friendly with all these people, you know, like all these other galleries, even though they don't show me. And then I form a relationship with them because say they're doing a group show, I'd be like, hey, you should check out this person. Or like, have you heard about this artist from the 70s? Blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of like this, uh, we help each other out kind of thing, you know? Because it's like, it, it seems very like clicky and shit, but everyone's kind of on the same team once it gets to a professional level, you know? Um, for the most part, but with Jasmine, it's great. Like, you know, I think the best thing is when I was looking for a gallery, like, you know, I had all these like, big shots coming up, but then if I needed money or I was broke or I needed a favor, I'd be too intimidated to ask them, you know? I'd also be the small fish in a giant pond where they don't need me, I need them. So I wanted to pick a gallery that A, was gonna support me whether or not I like, was gonna show with them or not, right? And then I wanted someone who I can grow with because that's really important too. Cause she's hustling just as hard as I'm hustling. So we both want it, you know? So like, you know, there's been times when I'm like, yo, I'm really broke, can you wire me $500? And she's like, I don't have it either, you know? Which is fine, and that's cool. So like, you know, with Jasmine, it's like really, I really trust her and, you know, we're friends. And then with my other gallery, big money one, you know, Massimo Carlo, they're fucking awesome. Like I did this show with them and they were, they were pursuing me for like two or three years and I was like, eh, eh. and I was like, I don't know. And then I did the show and I tried to test them as hard as I could. Like I pushed them like hard. They spent like $25,000 doing a build out that I was like doing blindly. It wasn't even there. They did it perfectly. They, the whole team was like helping me fucking mix paints at the end because they're still trying to finish. It was like the, the best working experience I've ever had. I'm like, fuck it, you guys bang, you know? And now I have, and both galleries like each other. They get along. It's like a big family, you know? Because you can't have one. You don't need more than two galleries also. Yeah. You know, it's having like, it's having like too many step parents or something. But they're not competing against each other either. No, uh-huh. they work together because that's the thing. We all want what's best for all of us. You know, that's if you're lucky. Yeah. Some guys get competitive and weird about stuff, but yeah. they're like, they're like tight, you know, they get it. So I'm lucky in that sense, but yeah, I mean, it's cool. It's like, you know, also like I view galleries as kind of like sports teams, like rosters, you know? <laughs> so it's like, it's kind of like, how good is the fucking team owner? You know what I mean? Because so, then they have a stable of other people. You're not always going to like everyone on the roster, but like, fuck it, you know? Yeah. But that's, that's how I view it. And you also worked in the galleries too. Do you think that for art students who are, you know, looking to get experience in the art world, do you think that working at these larger galleries is the way to go? Or yeah, I think smaller? Any, kind of, any kind of experience, you know? Anything, any, especially when it's professional, because once people, once you see a price tag next to art, it kind of like this hardens you or something. But that's what we're doing. We're making things to sell, you know? At the same time, like, yes, it is art. Obviously, that's why we're doing it. No one goes into art for money. 
seriously, you know, but there is a business aspect to it. And I think if you don't know that you can fuck yourself, you know, you have to be a smart business person because that's a lot of it. Like basically you're a small business owner, you know, and like eventually you maybe you'll have employees, maybe you won't, you know, maybe you have to deal with fabrication. You have to do consignment forms. It's not just like making stuff, you know, you have to like be able to sell yourself too, you know, and also like how to protect yourself because people like honestly people want to make money off of you at some point if you make good enough shit people are gonna try to make money off of you which is okay because you're trying to get some shit from them too so you just got to figure out how to dangle the carrot the right way you know that's i mean that uh, and you got to be able to sell it you know yeah like you can't just i've been to so many studio visits where like this person is such a pussy you cannot say anything and they're just like well, um, yeah and it's like listen they know what the shit looks like you don't have to explain everything. Just you don't have to entertain or tap dance either, but give it something to fuck with, you know? Because yeah. a lot of artists, I don't, I don't think they're, they're just making stuff, and it's like I don't even know what the fuck I'm supposed to be, what this is supposed to be. You know what I mean? I'm just, I'm really critical though, so that's my problem. You know, I don't like a lot of shit, but that's fine. I think it's good to be critical, and I think it's good to be angry because it keeps you energized and on your feet. That's not on your feet. Mm-hmm. This is my friend Brian Balot says. Anger yeah. is good, you know? It is good. Do you think that the influences, like, uh, if you're an artist relying on your paintings for money, is that's probably not the best thing, right? It's funny, like, so I have an assistant, and, you know, she mm-hmm. is young, she's great, she's a good painter, her name is Fran, mm-hmm. and she was like, you know, because so, I've been doing this for a couple of years now, so sometimes you're just, like, worn out, and you're like, oh. And she, she could tell I was in a rut, and she was like, uh, you know, it's like, like, I just want you to enjoy what you do. I want you to enjoy painting. I'm like, listen, bitch, <laughs> like, you are still in the zone where this is brand new, and you're just expressing yourself and having fun and making paintings. I am running a business here at the same time. People expect shit from me, and sometimes it's just like, fuck this. I just want to go and drink, you know? Like, you get in ruts and stuff, and it's like, once what you do that what is what you love starts putting money on the table and feeding you, then it becomes a different relationship. Then it becomes work, you know? So it's going to be work, but you just got to stay excited about your work, you know? So sometimes that means just taking a break and getting into something weird for like a month, you know? It's like, you know, I got really into fish tanks for like six months, you know? And like that kind of saved my ass, you know? Then I got into like interior decorating shit and blah, blah, blah. And like that kept me sane. Like whatever keeps you sane, fuck it, you know? When you get into a point where you're, you're starting to feel repetitive. You're starting to get bored with it. You just push it out to the extreme. Yeah, or you just do something totally, something you're uncomfortable with that you're like, this is probably a terrible idea, but I'm doing it anyway. Like right now, I am making this painting, which is going to have an actual microwave embedded inside of it. Yes. Like in the middle of it. But hold on, I'll show you what the painting is going to be. Uh, hold on. Cheese ball. Norman Rockwell scene, like the Campbell's soup kind of bullshit. But right where the turkey is, it's, we're gonna put like an actual microwave that's like, there are these like robotics, animatronics people are working on it. So you go inside and then it's gonna look like a rave when it's shut. And when it bangs open, it'll be normal. So it'll open and close every 30 seconds by itself. And then it's gonna have, I'm not telling you yet what's inside of it. So like, you know, what? that's what, I mean, what other step could I do besides like putting a microwave inside of something? You know, that's exciting to me. It's probably going to be like a $15,000 bad joke, but that's fine. You know, <laughs> like, I don't care. That sounds cool. I haven't seen that yet. So why not? You know, and it's also this painting is so iconically dumb. Like everyone knows it's fucking Norman Rockwell, you know, and there's so many parodies of this already. It's like the fucking dogs playing poker, you know, it's like so baseline. It's almost smart, you know, I think whatever. That's just me, though. You know. As you approach an image, do you do you have that thought? Like, have has this been done before? Can I do it again? Can I do it again to where it becomes something to where I know it's been done, and I'm doing it again because it's been done? I like th- making things that are so aggressively stupid you can't talk about them, and it's almost like a new thing. You know what I mean? Like, I remember I did this painting of a stop sign, and it just said "shut up," or it was like a stoplight. Mm-hmm. And it just here, I'll show you. I actually have a. I have a binder with all my paintings in it. This is also cool. When people come over to the studio, no one wants to look at your old paintings on the computer, so she made a binder. So you can hand this to someone, and they can kind of go through it on their own time. You know what I mean? Instead of like, you clicking through shit and then being bored as fuck. 
Um, but here's the painting, let me see. It is, I mean, this is so dumb. It's like, someone's like, well, what is this about? I'm like, are you fucking serious? Like, if you can't figure this shit out, something's wrong with you. Um, where did it go? Where did it go? Here it is. And you know what I mean? It's so dumb. It's like, okay, next. So shit like that. I like things that are like, so they're, it's almost, it's too stupid that it becomes smart, you know, or people aren't, they're not sure what they're supposed to think, you know? Yeah. Um, but sometimes simple stuff is really hard to, you know, deal with. So that's why I think it's like, for me right now, I'm trying to like get a bunch of the extra excess, like juxtaposition shit out of there. Cause that, I mean, I feel like when I started doing this and I sound like a cocky bitch, I mean, I probably am a cocky bitch, sorry everyone, but I feel like I was making stuff and I didn't realize it could have been potentially a new style without realizing it, right? So I already did something in terms of painting, but now it's like, how can I push that even further? So I don't even know what that would be yet. I'm just trying to figure out how I could push them to more of an extreme, which doesn't mean adding more shit to it, you know? And it doesn't mean like putting all my techniques in one painting, that's called a nightmare. It's called a visual nightmare. Like no one wants that, you know? That's gonna be like the ugliest fucking painting ever. But like, Absolutely. how can I really push them? You know, like content wise and also uh, visually, you know? Cause I could paint whatever, yeah. you know? I think the thing I really wanna learn how to do is paint impression, like, like an impressionist, no bullshit. And I tried it and did not look good. I tried like three times to put this one painting and it looked like shit. So that's probably the next thing I could learn to actually like, it's like, oh my God. Cause impressionism is so not important at all or relevant at all, you know? But if you can paint like a really relevant scene in Impressionist style, I think that'd be amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. No one wants to do that. That's like dorky as fuck, you know? But the problem with Impressionism is it can't just be a joke. So when you try to paint this shit, you actually have to care about it, you know? Like the colors have to look, it, this shit takes time. So I think my problem was the first thing I tried, I didn't care about, and you could tell, you know? So. I'll figure it out eventually. I don't know, self-portrait, something. <laughs> you know, I have no idea. Who were um, some of the, you, you were saying earlier, your early influences were very abstract and sort of uh, almost like academic in a way. But like, who are you looking at now? Who are your influences? I saw you had a thing with Peter Saul, which was awesome. Peter Saul is cool as shit. But it's funny, like, I love Peter, but I'm, I'm not influenced by him at all, which is weird. Really? Mm -hmm. Like the things I'm looking at, it's like Christo and John Claude, I love because they're. You just gotta watch Running Fence documentary. I like Keenholtz, Edward Keenholtz, and Nancy Keenholtz a lot. Um, I'm curating a group show. It was supposed to open already at, in London, but of course not because of COVID, so it's getting postponed. But it's fucking incredible. It's like um, I like Mirandi a lot. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like what I've been looking at, and then like I've been looking at. I mean, I've been going on chat roulette a lot, you know, which is actually really inspiring because, you know, it's like, um, you remember chat roulette or no? It's a website yeah. where it's like this, but like it's random strangers and you click. It was like cool like 10 years ago, but they still have it. Uh -huh. and it's better. It's a kind of good social practicing to learning how to talk to people or getting ideas from other people, you know? So you can just ask them like, what would you do? Or like, what do you think about this? You know, and like, they don't give a fuck. Like they don't have, they have no investment in you, you know? So it's a good way to like kind of gather information for painting ideas, you know, shit like that. That's kind of how I get super inspired, like dumb shit, you know, <laughs> but, or like, I, you know, I like generators. There's like generators online where you could do like four generators or like urbandictionary.com is also really good. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the shit. I mean, I also been buying junk drawers on eBay because I sell like junk lots of other people's junk drawers and like, you know, just kind of going through it, it's like super autistic, but you'll find one thing and be like, oh yeah, what if we fucking, that was like the base of the painting. You know what I mean? Someone else is like old shit. So like, you know, I've been buying like other people's VHS tapes and stuff, shit like that. So you know? through all this information to find something that just sparks. You don't, you don't fucking know, you know what I mean? You don't know where there's shit. Like, you know, all the yearbooks are really good too. You know, like, because you could see who's a loser by who signed the yearbooks and shit, you know. But then, like, you know, the graphics in them are really good. You can buy, like, art school yearbooks of just art students, so it's, like, really earnest teenage drawings. And they look terrible, but they're awesome. It's, like, very inspiring. So that's the kind of shit that, you know, it's because I'm trying not to look so much at art uh -huh. to get ideas, you know, because then it just becomes, like, a circle jerk. Yeah. 
you know, you gotta like look at shit that you didn't know was there or something, you know? Mm. I'm like out of my mind though, so whatever, you know? <laughs> and then what about, um, what about any artists who are around right now? Like who, who's doing stuff that excites you? I like Izzy Wood a lot. I think she's good. Um, I like Yana Euler a lot. Um, I like Matthew Maloof a lot. He just had a really fucking amazing show at Green Knot Dolly. Um, I like Paul Chan. Um, I'm trying to think who else that's really good. Um, I mean, those are the ones that I'm really, I think that are really good making smart shit. Um, hmm. Hmm, hold on, give me a second. I have someone. Smart shit. <laughs> Uh, Armand and Marisol, even though they're both dead, they're really cool, even though it's cheese ball. Um, but yeah, those are the, the living ones, you know. But yeah, as you would, Yana Euler, Paul Chan. Um, I just said someone else, I forget. Matt Copson's really good. Uh, it's, those are the ones I could think of off the top of my head. Mm. Yeah, Matt Team the Loop was the other one. That show was incredible. So everyone should look at it online. It was at uh, Green Up Dolly, but they're just like really perfectly painted shit paintings. They're amazing. It was like the best show I've seen in like God knows how long. I was like, actually, like I got excited to paint. This is my age, you know? And I was like, fuck, man, this is, show is perfect. You know, it was like a perfect show, which is rare because I hate everything, you know? I was like, fuck, I wish I made these, you know? And you saw it in New York? Mm -hmm. I was, I, like, I, made, I never go to Chelsea. So I made it a point to go to this thing. It's like, you know, an hour in the car or whatever for me. So worth it. Where are you at now? Uh, I live in bed in Brooklyn. And now I'm in Bush. My studio is in Bushwick, though. Uh -huh. So, and I'm actually right next to Josh Smith. His window's right there. So, and we also show at the same gallery. So, like, I always try to see what he's working on and shit, you know. But, um, yeah, I, I, I like it here. This is a new, I've had this studio for like a year now, but it's so much nicer. It's like, fuck. It's like baller as fuck. You know, I wish you could see the whole fucking. You're like a panoramic sweep. It's huge. Um, and then I built a kitchen shit over here. Um, if I could even watch it first, if you do tape. And there's my painting rack. Can't really see everything. And there's a whole wall of windows here. So there we go. That's it. <laughs> there's my dog sleeping on the couch. Crunchy. Oh. Yeah. How important do you think it, it, it is to be in New York versus like important. Francisco, LA? New York, number one, all the way. I don't even trust anything in LA. Yeah. I feel like LA just feels different. I don't know. I think New York's like the epicenter, you know? So if you can live in New York versus LA, I would fucking live in New York. But if you need space and you're a sculptor or something, then go to LA, you know? Because the rent is cheaper and you have room. But I think a lot of it is literally like being in New York, going around like, going to the openings, being part of, like, the scene and shit, because, like, it really, it, it sucks, but, like, that kind of bullshit socializing shit is important, you know? So, but I, yeah, I mean, I'm fucked. I can't move anywhere now. This is it, you know? And even if you go upstate, that's, like, the worst thing you could possibly do. It's for, like, losers going upstate. No offense to anyone who goes upstate. It's, like, where people go to die or something. It's, like, I've retired from excitement. I'm going upstate. That means you need time off, which means something's wrong with you, you know? What about uh, emerging places like on the outskirts of like the city, you know, like not yeah. Main Island? But they, yeah, like that's fine. Just as long as you can like get to an opening, you know, yeah. as long as you're within driving distance of an opening, you're fine, you know. That's what I think, but I do really think it is important to be here. Yeah. Like, unfortunately, you know, like I have friends that like, you know, moved to like Virginia and shit and they just feel like, they're like, what the fuck? Do I still have a career? Does anyone even care? You know? And it's like, yeah, they do, but, like, you just got to make it a point to come and see shit, you know? Because people will, like, you know, this shit moves so fast, people will forget, you know? How much so, of your, like, everyday life plays into, like, your career as an artist? Like, interacting with people, going to dinners, like, going to shows? I mean, this is the thing. Art is one of the weird uh, careers where it becomes your life, you know? Or your life is art, you know? Like, there's no separation, so, like... All of my friends, all of them pretty much are all artists. You know, we talk, all we do is like bitch about stuff we're making. You know, all the shows I watch are kind of like I'm influenced by for some reason and it has to do with my art. You know, like everything I do is about, you know, what I, this is it. This is like my life, you know? 
and it doesn't mean I'm obsessive. It doesn't mean I'm painting 24 hours a day, but it means that's just kind of like, you know, I, it's hard for me to separate me as an artist and me as a person. That's just how I am constantly. But like some people can switch it off and go home and chill, which is cool too. But like, I personally can't, you know, I'm like always on, you know? So for me, I can't fucking tell, you know, which is fine. But, you know, my biggest separation was having like painting clothes and having normal clothes. That was it. <laughs> you know, that was my, that was it. I was like, whoa, okay. Now this is like a thing, you know, that's it. But does that make sense? Kind of. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That, that wraps up all the questions that I had. Do you have any more gems of wisdom to spare? <laughs> yeah, hold on, let me think. Let me look. I'll show you guys on. Oh, yeah. I can... Okay, well, I found this in the garbage the other day. Wait until you see. No, the airbrush job is so shit. I'm obsessed. There's this one in here that looks like it's just like a glump of people. Look at this. Oh, my God. What the fuck, right? May need to paint that. Also, here's another book which has all student design of um, early computer, it's like uh, computer art, early design like from like 2000. Where do you find these? eBay. Here's another one. Bears. All, it's literally all teddy bears. Look at this, all of them. Do you have people just like texting you weird images all the time? Yeah, and I'm like, guys, like, and usually when people text me images, it's like shit. I'm like, that's too basic, please. Yeah. You know, like I, I know what I like and I know what to, where to get it. You know, that's the one thing I'm really good at, like hoarding this kind of stuff. Like when I found out that Playboy was going out of print, I was like, what the fuck? I literally bought every fucking color Playboy from 1962 until like 2018 because I wanted all the ads, you know, because like if those are lost, then it sucks. The only problem is I had to open all of them with uh, gloves because it's like they're all stuck together. It's disgusting. Oh. But, you know, that's the kind of shit I like, you know. Not like old cum, but old, like, you know, shit like this. I think it's like that. that's kind of like, I like anything that seems like an anomaly, you know. But I thought those are cool. I wish I had more cool shit. I took it all home with me. Or I can't move around, you know. Yeah. But that's kind of it. I mean... Yeah. Oh, another little thing. If anyone asks you what your favorite color is, just say clear. It's like such a fucking middle school thing to say. I know. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's it. Do you have any questions for me? That, that's it. Thank okay, you so much. And then I'll... Uh...